Hello, this is a daily COVID update from Deccan Herald. I am Akhil. On the bulletin today, Karnataka records 93 new cases till date. Domestic air travel resumes across the nation. And also in the bulletin, Aman Nair, a policy officer at the Center for Internet and Society on why we need to continue to ask questions about Arogya Situ and its future in a post-pandemic world. It's almost impossible to assume that COVID-19 will be sorted within a year or like will be completely eradicated within two years. That can be used as justification to uh, continue the application. But first, a look at the daily figures. At the time of this recording, India has over 80,000 active cases in the country right now and has recorded over 4,000 deaths. ICMR has tested more than 30 lakh samples with the novel coronavirus so far and more than 90,000 samples in the last 24 hours. Before we take a look at the figures from Karnataka, however, here are some key updates from the country. The Supreme Court said today that it found the circular allowing Air India to fill up middle seats in flights disturbing. The flights referred by the Supreme Court were being operated to bring back Indians stranded abroad, despite the COVID-19 pandemic. It said that the center should seek to maintain social distancing and be more worried about the health of the citizens rather than that of the airline. Moving on to the numbers from Karnataka. 93 cases reported from the state today, a respite from the high numbers being reported so far. 72 of the 93 cases have a travel history to Maharashtra. Other travel histories include Tamil Nadu, Delhi, Uttar Pradesh, the UAE, and Muscat. The highest number of cases today have been reported from Udupi district with 32 positive cases. This includes 27 from Maharashtra and 2 from the UAE. Kalburgi has reported 16 cases and Yadgiri 15, all of whom have returned from Maharashtra. Bangalore Urban has eight new cases and there are a mix of domestic and international travel contacts of previously diagnosed patients and one with sorry. Rest of the districts have reported cases in single digits. A 55-year-old woman from Bangalore Rural who had been diagnosed with severe acute respiratory infection passed away to acute respiratory distress syndrome. And a 43-year-old man from Dakshina, Canada with liver cirrhosis passed away on the day he was admitted to the hospital. With this, the state has reported 2,182 cases in total, of which more than 1,400 are active cases. 705 patients have recovered, but 44 have died. Moving on to a few updates from Karnataka. After two months, domestic air service resumed at Kempegada Airport in Bengaluru, and Air Asia flight to Ranchi became the first domestic flight to take off at 5.15 a.m. this morning. However, nearly 30 departing flights were canceled, leaving many passengers frustrated. The last-minute cancellations were triggered by institutional quarantine mandated by the state government for passengers arriving from red zone cities. Additionally, there were limitations imposed by the various states, adding to the confusion. Union Minister D.V. Sadananda Gowda, who flew into Bengaluru from the high-risk Delhi, was not subject to the mandatory institutional quarantine. He said that he was exempted from the guidelines since he belonged to the essential pharma sector and that he was the minister in charge of pharmaceuticals. As air travel resumes in most cities, passengers have been asked to download Argo Situ onto their smartphones. The contact tracing app has been in the eye of the storm for not being transparent with its functioning, alarming privacy activists. My colleague Amulia spoke to Aman Nayar, a policy officer at the Center for Internet and Society, to ask what happens to the Arogya Setu once the COVID threat is gone. Uh, thank you, Aman, for joining us. Uh, thank you for having me. So my first question to you is this. Why has all over the world contact tracing apps have become two-tip solution for coronavirus? So I think it's important to understand that contact tracing has a really long history in epidemiologistic uh, sort of uh, fields and it's been successfully utilized in the case of a number of other viruses and diseases. What's special about coronavirus though is that you're essentially dealing with a virus of highly, that's highly transmiss, transmissible and also incredibly deadly. And so in those situations you're sort of limited in how far manual contact tracing can go. And so that's why a lot of states seem to be turning towards uh, digital contact tracing applications to try and combat the virus. And I think the danger lies um, in current models of contact tracing that we assume it's going to be the solution in and of itself. Coming to Arogya Setu in particular, why has it alarmed privacy activists in India? So there are a number of issues with Arogya Setu beginning with privacy. So one of the issues is the inability to understand what exactly happens with the data. So 
we are unsure because we are unaware of the nature of the code of Arogya Setu, what exactly the application collects in terms of data, how long this data is stored for, and what all this data can be used for. While the government has made certain efforts to try and clarify that, most notably the protocol that they uh, released, the, the conditions of the protocol remain vague. Um, a simple example is that the sunset clause included in the protocol simply speaks about the protocol itself and nothing about the actual data. On top of that, you also have security concerns, again, stemming from the fact that we don't understand the architecture of this application and that the government has expressly prevented the reverse engineering of this application. And finally, also, we have the issue of accessibility in terms of individuals who may not have smartphones, but also for people who may have specific impairments or disabilities, you know, someone who's blind may not be able to easily access the, uh, the application and then to therefore make it mandatory poses its own set of issues. Okay, so what happens when, you know, this crisis is gone and the government has this whole database, so what's going to happen? Uh, so, I mean, that's the million dollar question and the thing is no one really knows. Um, what I would say is that governments don't tend to give up data easily over the course of history. Uh, and it's not only that you're dealing with data collected during the course of the pandemic, you're essentially dealing with the creation of a completely new surveillance infrastructure. So one of the underlying issues is that while government may not make something um, mandatory in law, it's entirely possible that the way it's implemented at a societal level makes it mandatory on the ground. I mean, to give you like a really simple example, when I called and asked for a haircut, uh, I was told that I would have to show my Arugya Setu uh, application, and otherwise I wouldn't be allowed in. And so you're essentially worried about the indirect effects as well as the direct surveillance effects. You're worried that while the government may not, uh, or may make promises to not entrench it within our legislation, that the prolonged use of it over a course of time will nonetheless entrench it in the way we think of our society. What is, what's our future going to be from, a, from the context of how we have responded to coronavirus, you know, the way we have turned to technology? So there's obviously the future in terms of the actual existing technology itself. The possibility of Arogya Seta now being mandated for a wider range of um, things than it was initially meant to. So for example, um, you know, there's confusion right now about whether Arugya Setu is mandatory for air travel. And then also I think you have a broader worry of, or not broader worry, but you have a broader paradigm of states now turning exclusively to technology to be the solutions of their problems, specifically health problems. I think traditionally uh, from now on you're going to see a complete shift in how health policy is thought of, especially in the mainstream. I think you're going to see a lot of government officials in the future attempting to solve health issues through a purely technological um, framework. And while technology has its place in a healthcare framework, I think something that's been really interesting is that you see a lot of healthcare officials and healthcare policymakers stressing the fact that technology is merely one aspect of that and that our society in the future can't be completely guided by technological elements, especially in this space. That's all from us today. For the latest updates, log on to Decanel.com. Stay safe and we'll see you tomorrow.